Uh, last time we were talking about the paper by Eski Günetol, and if you recall, we defined uh, well, we defined the problem, and we also mentioned about the costs that are included, and the key cost that we were given is the cost of uh, how do we call that cost of lead time. So this is continuation for Eskigün at all 2005 okay so we are interested in the lead time costs so the key issue is how are we going to manage the lead time costs now this is this is a novel approach to consider the lead time costs in the way that we are going to see and moreover uh, it is meaningful up to a certain extent, but we have to understand what it means. Now, in general, the way that they see the lead time cost is as follows. They say that if we are transporting an item from one location to another, okay, and uh, if you recall, uh, let's say that we are moving from A to B, and uh, the key idea is that the movements are done usually in terms of truck loads or railway uh, car loads. Okay, so let me just write railway so that we don't mix up with uh, something else. Okay, so uh, as I described you, each of these cars or trucks will carry eight different automobiles. So what happens is that every time that you have a truck waiting, what you do is as they come to the outbound of this location A, they are going to be stacked in the truck or in the rail car. So what happens is that uh, you are going to put one of them and then there will be another one coming in. And note that the trucks or the car loads, rail, rail car loads, are not necessarily composed of the same item. You can have different SKUs there with different colors and even different brands. So question here is if A has a large uh, incoming rate, in other words, if we have a very busy uh, place, A, then what we are going to do is this filling up the car is going to be very fast. Whereas if it is a sort of like, it's not the, if the incoming rate is not that high, then we are going, this truck is going to wait for some time until it is filled. So what happens is that, there is a standard waiting time related to a certain location, which is you, you have to process regardless the, the, the trucks or the traffic, you have to make some adjustments, so on and so forth, which is dependent on the location. So there is a fixed time. And then there is another time, which is a function of the flow, but it is inversely related to that function. Inversely meaning that as the volume increases, this is going to be faster. Okay? So this is the way that they define the so-called waiting costs or they like to call it the dwell time or dwell costs. Dwell is the time that it's, it's uh, synonymously used in this case for waiting. So the way that it's described here is simply an A which is a constant. Okay? So you are always going to have some kind of a waiting time and which you cannot change by volume, but there is one part that can be changed by volume, and that's A plus B divided by the total volume. This volume is the volume that passes through A. So if you have a larger volume coming into A, you're going to have actually a quicker fill up of the truck or the rail car, and the waiting time is going to be less. So uh, if you think of this in the following way, if the volume is very, very large, like infinite, then there is no waiting time in order to fill up a truck. So you only wait the standard time and leave. 
So this is, this is basically the idea which is uh, followed when they are charging part of the lead time cost. Now, uh, this is interesting. Why? Because volume that we are going to have in a certain location is a function of the decision variables in the system. In other words, the more we assign to a certain location, whether it is a VD, v, uh, uh, the, the more we assign to a distribution center, vehicle distribution center, the quicker the response will be with respect to waiting. Okay, so this is more or less the idea which is followed. Of course, there are a number of things that should be discussed and I'm going to discuss later on. Well, I can discuss it now as well. This may not represent reality. Why? Well, because you have this A, which is independent of the volume. If you ask me, on the other hand, if you get closer to the capacity of the warehouse, or uh, distribution center, excuse me, then things are going to get slower and slower. In other words, think about a, where, uh, a distribution center which can handle 1,000 trucks or 1,000 automobiles per day. What do we mean by handle? Well, you are going to have some incoming automobiles, you are going to have some outgoing automobiles, and the rate of incoming and outgoing would be in the long run more or less equal to each other. So you have to be able to handle the, and there are also automobiles in the uh, DC, and what you have to do is you have to uh, basically control the traffic, incoming traffic, outgoing traffic. You have a lot of traffic going on, and actually in reality, if you are going to have 1,000 automobiles coming in, which is equal to capacity, you are going to have extremely long queues of waiting. So this A is not going to be a constant, but it will be a function of the volume. But not in this manner now, it will increase by the volume. Now, if you, if you think about uh, the simplest queuing system, MM1, okay, and so let's say that this is sort of the traffic intensity of an MM1, and this is the waiting time, let's say, in the queue. As the traffic intensity gets close to 1, if you recall that relationship, okay, this is going to be something like this. In other words, the waiting time exponentially increases. So if you apply the same logic to a very congested uh, distribution center, you are going to see this shape there. What is the meaning of this? You're going to wait for very long times if it is a very crowded uh, uh, operation. Okay, so on the other hand, this works just in the reverse manner. If we have more intensity, okay, the load time of the trucks or rail cars will be faster because you have a lot of incoming and you can easily fill the car up. So you can see that this is not a very standard logic which is used here. It's sort of a little bit counterintuitive if you look at from the queuing point of view, but they claim that this is the reality in GM, and especially GM wanted them to model this, uh, everything this way. And I can understand this, especially consider a, a, a vehicle distribution center, and what you have is, let's say that you have a lot of demand points around this vehicle distribution center. Now, more or less every day you are going to ship, or every reasonable time you are going to ship one truck, okay, to one of your customer zones. So given that you are going to ship one truck, and if this vehicle distribution center is not a very uh, dense center with respect to the number of cars, think about very rural area, a very rural area, okay? So what will happen is that as you want to fill the trucks, maybe you have to wait three days for the truck to fill up in the way that you want. Okay? So this is what they are reflecting in their model. They are not reflecting the congestion which is created by the traffic intensity in the warehouse. They are taking it as a constant. Okay? 
So you can understand that maybe uh, the situation is, I can see that probably GM, before starting this project, had a lot of distribution centers in rural areas because they wanted to cover the market as good as possible, uh, in the best possible way. And at the same time, they wanted to fill this trucks or rail cars fully. So this turns out that, okay, if you have a DC in a very rural area where demand is very small, then you are going to wait for a long time for the truck to fill up. So this is what they have modeled. Whereas I would think that this type of modeling would make more sense in most of the other cases. Okay, any questions on this dwell time? Now we are going to see how this is applied, but this is more or less the idea. This is the main idea actually in the paper. They never mentioned that A and B should be positive, but if you look at the paper and later on the way that they modeled it, they should be post positive. So one may think that, well, if B is negative, okay, what will happen if B is negative? Then as volume increases, okay, you are going to increase the dwell time. So you think that it will basically represent this one, but they need to have A and B both positive uh, for the model to work. A should be positive by definition, actually, but B should be positive. Otherwise, the, uh, uh, the, the integer programming formulation that they propose is not going to work if B is negative. Okay, and what else? Okay, I think this is more or less uh, what, in general, I want to talk about dwell time. Any questions on this? So you can see your, uh, the way, why, why modeling is, is, is very important, even if this is a very standard problem. Okay, modeling becomes important because unless you have this trick here, this model is going to be a standard model. But this is the trick that makes the model a little bit different and probably responding to the requirements of that specific situation. Okay. Now, by the way, you can imagine a number of other things uh, that will need this type of uh, waiting time approach. Uh, those of you who are familiar with logistics, actually, uh, they, they do that as well. For example, the, uh, you, you see, in some cases, the economies tell you that you need to carry this car or this truck full. Otherwise, it will be too expensive. The, the, the transportation will be too expensive. Sometimes they prefer to drive the automobiles rather than... Uh, they take a lot of risk, by the way. But they prefer to drive the automobiles rather than using a truck empty full, uh, half empty, excuse me, okay? Uh, I have seen those examples, then they play with the kilometer and they set it to zero, okay? They can do that actually, I mean, because basically, but you, it, is, it is too risky. In other words, what happens if there is some kind of a damage, okay? A firm owns the, the, the automobile and they are driving it. So it is a it is little bit, uh, uh, difficult situation, but they usually want to fill this up. Okay, now let's apply this, for example, to the computation of the lead time in between the plant to a vehicle distribution center. The notation seems to be a little bit confusing in the beginning, but I think once you understand the, the letters, it describes a lot of things. This is the lead time from the plant to the vehicle distribution center. So what are the subscripts that we should have? Well, a vehicle distribution center to the demand point. So we are going to have I, J, K here. It will start from plant I. It will go through vehicle distribution center J. It will go to the demand point D, which is demand point K. So we are looking for that whole lead time. Now, why, do we, why are we interested with that lead time? Because depending on that, on the way that we make decisions, this lead time is going to change. But we need to write what this lead time is. So this lead time is going to be, well, let me first define that. This is the lead time from plant I to demand 
point K through VDCJ. Now you can see that why they have used vehicle distribution center is to use V rather than another D in the same location. <laughs> Probably that, that might be another reason. Okay. So uh, what is this lead time? Now, first of all, we are going to have the transportation time from the plant to the VDC. So this is going to be IJ. Okay, there is a transportation time from I to J. So this is transportation time from plant I to VDC J. Now, what is this transportation time? Well, it depends. If you have, if you are using rail, then this is going to be the time that it takes for the rail to go there. But we're talking about a, a specific, we are not talking about direct shipment here. So it means that we are always going to take the train to go from I to J. Okay? So this time is given. So there is no uncertainty around that time. Then you have the time from the VDC to the demand point. Okay, so this is the transportation time from VDCJ to K, demand point K. This is also a constant. This is, this is called the transit time or the transportation time. This is the truck time. Plus, now we are going to have two weightings. And what are these weightings? One of them is time, the dwell time uh, that we are going to have when we are carrying the item from P to V. So this is going to have a subscript of IJ. This is the dwell time. at I for items moving to J. And then what else do we have? We have the dwell time from V to the demand point. So we are going to have DT, VD, JK. And this is simply the dwell time at VDC uh, vehicle distribution center J for moving items to K. Okay, now let's write these in the notation which is used in the text. So this is equal to, the way that it is defined is, this is CIJ and then you have a superscript 1. This is the constant term. This is the way that they define. Plus, you're going to have C2IJ divided by... Now, what is the total volume that goes to I? Okay. Now, the total volume that goes to I is simply summation DIK. Uh, let me check that. Uh, okay. So, okay, overall case. Uh, is this DIK or DJ? DIK, XI, JK. Now, this is the total volume in I, which is, which should be forwarded to v, uh, VDCJ. And what is that? This is, these are the demands for items at the, uh, uh, at the VDCJ. And because basically we sum over all case, which means that we sum over all the demand values of the uh, VDCJ. 
And so you have dIk, which shows the demand values, actually. And what is xIjk, if you recall? Well, we didn't, did we define that? No, not yet. xIjk is uh, 1 if ijk line is active. Okay? Now, we, we can see that. So you can see that this is the volume that will go for j. And as a function of that volume, you are going to have a waiting time. If that volume is very small, then you're going to wait a lot because the automobiles are going to come slowly, so on and so forth. So similarly, you can write this one. So this is basically how we are going to uh, use this dwell time. Now, I should have, of course, defined the, some of the notation before, but we already are aware now. So dIk is the demand of k for product of i. In other words, you have plant i, a specific model, and this is the demand. And similarly, x i j k is 1 if plant i serves k via j and 0 otherwise. And then we are going to have uh, different variables. Uh, Z i j k, well, actually there is a correction. It should be Z i k. And there is a typo in the paper as well. This is Z i k. Z i k is going to be 1 if direct shipment if direct shipment from I to K is performed and zero otherwise. Finally, we are going to have VJ. This is one or zero if J is open and zero otherwise. Okay, so these are the basic decision variables used in the problem. Okay. So any questions on, on this part? Okay, so this is basically the, the part which is interesting. And the rest is, well, the rest we're going to see there is also like an interesting way of handling this problem. Now, let's write the capacitated model. So what we are going to do is we are going to minimize cost of Overall IJK, cost of transportation, which is more or less standard. So you have DIK, XIJK. In other words, depending on the route that you select, you are going to pay some cost of transportation. I didn't write it explicitly. Now, you are going to have a cost of transportation. This is for IK if you have direct shipment as well. So this is cost of transportation times the IK, ZIK. Okay? In other words, if you directly supply the demand point, you are going to have a different transportation cost. This cost of transportation is going to be rail plus truck. This transportation cost is going to be only truck, okay, from the factory, from the plant to the place. Plus, we have the lead time related costs, okay. So let's consider what those costs are. But before going into that, I am going to define H, which is the cost per unit of lead time. Okay, so this is like holding cost kind of a thing. If you have longer lead time, you're going to charge more. So uh, I'm continuing with the objective function. We have summation overall IK, I, uh, JK, excuse me, all of them. Okay, now what we have is we have H times L T. This is the lead time from plant 
to a vehicle distribution center J to the demand point K. And this is the total lead time, like the one that we have written here. And what I will do is I will multiply this with D I K. This is the demand for product I at demand point K times X I J K. So this is the cost that you pay for the lead time. And then what you have is you have a similar cost if there is direct shipment. So you have summation over all I K H times L T lead time for going from plant to demand. And then here we have I Ks. Now you have D I K times Z I K. Okay. Then the final term in the objective function is summation of the fixed cost of opening a certain VDC times VJ. So this sum is overall J. So this is the objective function. Again, the first two is, is standard. Okay, you charge according to the route that you take. The fifth one is standard. The ones which are not standard is the cost that we charge for the lead time. You see that it's a linear cost and it's linear cost per unit of the material that you, you carry. Okay? So uh, I, would, I would think that this cost would have, uh, would be proportional to the value of the item which is carried. But uh, I think they assume that the values are more or less the same. Okay? But it's not very difficult to put a CI here to reflect the value of the item. Okay? It's, it's very standard. Okay. Now, th this is the objective function. Of course, we have some constraints. We have to make sure that these constraints are satisfied. Okay, so let's look at the constraints. Now, one thing that you should notice here is the following. The variables that we're talking about, okay? Now, here, this is an integer variable, 0, 1 binary variable, and it is multiplied by the lead time variable. Now, when we look at the lead time variable, okay, this is a constant in the lead time variable. This is a constant in the lead time variable. This is a function of x, i, j, k's, and it is in the denominator, okay? And this is another function of z, i, k, and it is in the denominator, okay? So what you have is you have an integer or binary, but a nonlinear structure here. So it's not easy to solve it as is. Okay? But first, before going further, let's look at the, uh, let's look at the constraints. We have uh, actually uh, very straightforward constraints. Now, sum over all j, x, i, j, k, plus z, i, k should be equal to 1 for all i k pair. Now, what does this mean? This means that I should satisfy all the demand points, either by direct shipment or shipment via the uh, uh, vehicle distribution center. Very, very straightforward, actually. And what I have to do is I have to make sure that summation over all i k times d i j k Oops, uh, over all i k correct uh, d i k x i j k should be less than the capacity of of the uh, vehicle distribution center this is the total volume that goes through J, and this is true for all J, 
And this is the capacity of alternative J for the vehicle distribution center. Okay, it's called KV sub J. Okay, why it is not CV but KV, I don't know. I think because one of the authors is Turkish probably. He wrote capacite rather than capacity. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't find any other reason for this. Okay. So, but this is basically uh, the one of the key constraints because this is the constraint on the capacity. And then we have... Uh, of course, x i j k, z i k, and v j's, all element of the binary set, and this is true for all i j k. Okay, so this is the program that you solve, but the problem is the nonlinearity. So here. This program is going to be a nonlinear binary type mathematical programming problem. Nonlinear integer programming problem, we call it in general. Nonlinear integer programming problem. Now, the, how are we going to handle this? Some of you may know, actually. What you can do is if you have nonlinearity, you can introduce more binary variables to get rid of the nonlinearity. So this is what we're going to do. So uh, I will explain that part now. So it is a technical issue, of course, but I think it is important to know those. Otherwise, you will never be able to solve any problem. Yes? Uh, in this case, uh, do we restrict the number of the, the uh, distribution samples? No, you have costs. No. You have customs, uh, you have costs related to that. You have fixed cost of opening a certain no. vehicle distribution center. Uh, the vehicle will visit at most one distribution center. You mean a vehicle? Of course, yes. Why should it go to the two distribution centers? In other words, well, can, you, can you repeat the question? You said vehicle. By going from I2K? Yes, it will visit only one distribution center, of course. Why should it uh, visit more than one distribution center? Why does it visit a distribution center? Well, uh, it visits a distribution center because it is more costly to have a direct shipment. Maybe. Okay, you have a pooling effect when you set up a, a vehicle distribution center. Now, your question is, why is our distribution system only one stage? In other words, why not have uh, some uh, major distribution centers and then regional distribution centers, so on and so forth? Well, okay, that's another thing, but you can actually, as long as you can reach everywhere by train, you are not going to need to have that. But if you have certain regions where train is not available and demand is considerable, you might think of having a sort of an, an umbrella uh, distribution center above the vehicle distribution centers. You're, you're right, actually. But here we don't have that. So it means that a vehicle is either going to go from the plant to a distribution center than to the market, or it will directly go to the market. Okay. Now, the transfer point that we have in the rail is not considered. In other words, in the rail, we know that there will be some transfer points, but that belongs to the railroad company. So that's the reason why they are not going to be concerned. In other words, if you are shipping something from, let's say, Chicago, to, well, from uh, Kars, okay, to uh, Izmir, okay? So, and you are shipping something from Kars, to Samsung. So what, what will happen is that the rail car is going to take it all the way to Ankara, both of these loads. Then you are going to separate those cars. Some of them will continue to Izmir, some of them will continue to Samsung. So there will be two different rail 
uh, railways actually going to these two directions. So there is some kind of a time which is lost in Ankara because you have to make those changes. It is not considered here because basically I think they are buying the service from a railroad company. So the railroad company simply gives them the time to go from Kars to Samsung. And it is the railroad company's responsibility to manage the, the changes and so on and so forth. Okay, I think that was, that was, that's a very relevant question. But the owner there is somebody else. Okay, any, any questions on the question or the comments? Okay, now uh, how are we going to deal with this is, let us see now. So we have nonlinearity coming into picture. So we want to clean up that nonlinearity. Now, uh, this is the trick which is usually used. We are going to define a ij, which is 1 if summation over all k, xijk is positive. In other words, if there is a flow from i to k through j, we are going to call this as, we are going to use another variable, Aij, which is going to be 1 or it's, it will be 0 otherwise. In other words, if there is a flow, this is going to take a value of 1. Similarly, we are going to define Bjk as 1 if summation over all xijk, this time over i, is greater than 0 and 0 otherwise. Now, what does this variable is doing? This variable is doing the following. If you have any flow from uh, j to k, okay, it is going to take a value of 1. Otherwise, it will take a value of 0. Now, why, are we, why do we need this? Well, we are, you are going to see that in order to make uh, the objective function linear, we need to introduce linear or binary, completely binary rather, or to eliminate the nonlinearity, we need, we need to introduce these variables. And then finally, we are going to have a i k, and this is going to be 1 or 0, and this is going to be 1 if z i k is positive, 0 otherwise. In other words, if there is a flow from i to k, direct flow, then I'm going to define another variable. We may not need this variable, but I think uh, we'll see how it is utilized. You see, because it's already the same thing. If zik is 1, then you are going to have eik 1. Uh, you may, you, we might need it somewhere. I'm not sure now. Okay. So let's look at the constraint now. How are we going to use this? Now, uh, if you recall, let me write dt pv i j. This is, uh, what, what is this? This is the dwell time for items that go from p, from the i plant to the j VDC. We define this as c i j 1 plus c i j 2 divided by summation d i j k x, excuse me, d i k x i j k over all k. And this is going to be true if a i j as defined here is 1 and 0 otherwise. Okay, if you have a flow, then this lead time is going to be a positive number. Otherwise, you are not going to have this lead time. Note that in the previous definition, of course, we didn't, we would expect that in general, if there, there is no flow from i to j, the dwell time is not going to be important. So you should set it to 0. Whereas now, only with the definition of aij, we can do that. Now, what is the objective function term, if you recall? The objective function term related to that is the summation over all i, uh, j, k. 
okay, H times D T P V I J times D I K times X I J K. Okay? So what I will do now is I'm going to rewrite this component of the objective function using the AIJ term. So this is going to be equal to okay, uh, summation I over all I, J, K, H, now I'm going to replace this, C, I, J, 1 plus C, I, J, 2 divided by summation over all K, D, I, K, X, I, J, K, times D, I, K, X, I, J, K, okay, times A, I, K, AIJ, excuse me. In other words, I am only going to have this if IJ branch is used. Otherwise, what will be the cost? Otherwise, the cost is going to be, if you don't have anything, what should be the cost? Uh, well, uh, okay, you, you see, uh, again, what I did is the following. If AIJ is 1, then it means that this term is going to be active, and I said I write this as a multiplication. If AIJ is zero, then this cost is going to be zero. Very simple. Now, of course, now now what's happening is that you you it's it seems that we have an additional nonlinearity coming into picture, but you can see that we are going to separate the summation over i, j, k, you are going to sum over i, j, and then k separately. So when you sum over k, these terms are going to cancel each other. Okay? And then we are going to have a, a form which is no longer nonlinear. Excuse me? Okay, yeah. I, 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 will, I will write that. So here uh, we have this form, and what is the constraint? The constraint is, well, let me write it here. X, I, J, K should be less than or equal to A, I, J. In other words, if any of the X, I, J, Ks is going to take a positive value, A, I, J should be equal to 1. So this is the constraint, and this is true for all I, J, K. You can see how the size of the problem is... Uh, sort of going up, but we are cleaning up the nonlinearity. Of course, if I take from this point on, so uh, it is going to be equal to, uh, this is my sort of like, I think the, this is the last equation that I want to write. So we are going to have summation over all i, j, k. Now, what do I have now? Uh, the first term, I will have H times CIJ1, DIK, XIJ, K, AIJ. And let me write this. So this is going to be H times CIJ1, DIK, XIJ, K. Now, do I need to have the AIJ there? No. Because if you look at here, if any of the XIJ, K is 1, then I'm going to have AIK1. So to, to write both of them for this case is going to be redundant. So this is going to be my first term. And what will be my second term? My second term summed over all IJ is simply going to be H times CIJ2 times AIJ. Now, how did that elimination happen? I summed over all k. So, you see, when you are summing over all k, this part is going to be a constant. So, you sum this part over all k. You see that it is exactly the same thing when you sum over all k. So, they are going to cancel. You will be left with aij, cij2 times h, summed over all ij. Of course, from here, 
you see that you need to have this term positive, okay? Otherwise, it's not going to make sense. In other words, if you have this term negative, then uh, the program is not going to respond in the way that you want. You should have that a positive value. Why? Because if you have it negative, then uh, it means that you have economies of opening AIJ, setting AIJ equal to 1, without having any xijk in that set equal to 1. Okay? So if, if you want this to, to work, you have to make sure that cij2 is always positive. Otherwise, this is not going to work. So this is the trick that they do. And with this trick, what happens is that now they have, as a result, they have a, a binary program or an integer program with binary variables. Of course, you can see that the number of variables exploded. So particularly, they solve problems of size with two, two million variables, binary variables. It's a huge problem. So what they, are, they do is they offer a number of uh, different procedures. And they have, uh, but they basically apply a Lagrangian relaxation algorithm to solve this problem more or less efficiently. They may not be able to obtain the optimal solution in every case, but they usually uh, record the gap, and the gap is, is rather small. Uh, I don't remember what they use for. Uh, oh, OK, we didn't use that, because what you, you, we need to do is we need to write the same uh, dwell time for direct shipment, the same dwell time for shipments from the VDC to, uh, to, to the demand points. So you are, we are going to use BJK and EIK when we write those. Okay? We only wrote for one of the lead times, actually. You have three lead times. Okay? We only used one of them, actually. I didn't do the others. But the others can be done in a similar way. The logic is simply you apply this and you obtain, you eliminate the nonlinear structure. You might be familiar with that, actually. Uh, I think there might be some simpler modeling examples where you write, if you have multiplication of two uh, variables, then by defining a binary variable, which is going to take one, if each of them is one, Okay, then you can make the you can eliminate the nonlinearity. So this is actually what is done here, in a in a little bit different context. Of course, they apply the Lagrangian relaxation. The rest of the paper results uh, or tells us about the scenarios and the things that they have run, and and and, and so on. So uh, you can see that you can obtain a lot of different results uh, once you have the machinery available. They have done a lot of sensitivity analysis, and so on and so forth. But the key issue in this paper is, of course, the definition of the dwell time, which is lead time, which I think fits the case. You can see that it immediately is going to complicate what you are doing, but it is one way of taking into account the inventory cost or the uh, pipeline cost into account. In this way, you can take the pipeline cost into account. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, yeah. We have a question. Do, do you have any questions? Okay, I think we're done. On Tuesday, we are going to start uh, Clark and Scarf and uh, uh, metric models. So please be prepared for that. I will be able probably to finish Clark and Scarf uh, on, uh, on Tuesday and maybe introduce the other paper, okay? I will, I will try to summarize that. Try to read that, and I want you to understand the difficulty in understanding sort of old papers. Okay.